Uh, I'm going to move on and I'm going to hand over to Patrick for 20 minutes to take us through his presentation and his input. I'll do a five minute response and then we'll have other comments and engagements. We'll similarly do the same with Carolee and, and then, of course, Duma uh, and Asga. Over to you, Patrick. Amanda, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I didn't hear anybody say a where to, but I know there's a lot of power to the people. Um, Vish, if you can uh, stop your screen share, then I can do my dreaded uh, PowerPoints. How's that? Is that a deal? Um, for me, it's uh, slightly changing from merely presenting because I think what, uh, let me just see if this does come up nicely. Um, what uh, Vishwas has done is um, opened up uh, conceptual challenges. So um, what you've got, if you've got that paper, I think you're all seeing my, my screen, right? Which has, if, if all goes well, the title page. And so it goes through uh, basically the three terrains of, of macro. And those um, are basically the, the uh, fiscal, the monetary, financial, and the international economic. So um, I'm assuming, Vish, that uh, you, Jane, Jane's always incredibly efficient, um, have either sent these round or I don't know if people have had access to the oh, paper. Patrick, just to say we haven't sent them out because we want to give feedback today and, and, and we'll send out the next iteration after there's revision and so on. But we are okay. recording this and we'll share this as a, as a resource. As, yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. I, I have in that paper gazillions of graphs and charts and all the rest. So I was thinking about running through them all, but then decided that wouldn't be fair. Let's let's do something that um, sets the contextual stage. And that would mean two things. I think first, let me um, start just by summing up what this paper is trying to do, which is go through the fiscus and particularly look at whether there is funding to have a climate justice deal to do the sort of thing that we saw yesterday, Joe Biden in the US failed to do to, to put climate deep into a, a stimulative uh, uh, infrastructure policy and to have a, expansive fiscal policies. We can, we can talk about that. But the second um, is uh, to look at the monetary and financial uh, system. Um, and actually with Duma in the house, it's, it's wonderful. He's probably been uh, South Africa's loudest voice when it comes to the um, challenging you know, central bank orthodoxy and the failure to print money to uh, generate more uh, open uh, fiscal opportunities through the monetary system, uh, to lower the interest rate, to impose exchange controls, uh, all of the things that relate to monetary and finance. And of course, I also like to look at, I happen to work in the Federal Reserve in the US, the worst of the big central banks, and its deregulatory orientation was one of the reasons that consumer credit first went from a kind of um, redlining to a predatory excess for ordinary people. And we are suffering very much that um, it was peaking in around 2008, but I go into the sort of household financial budget uh, that reflects the lack of strong regulation. The fact that you could get a, um, a cash, pay cash pay master services, uh, giving out our grants to 19 million people and then putting microfinance on top. And you know the kind of deregulatory finance that leads to such awful predatory activities for the household. But back to the macro, the critical question, which I'll just take up now quickly, what's the status of our international economic relations? Because the greater the propensity to a crisis, the more that we felt last April, May, June, um, when there was a sort of surprising openness to thinking about um, building back better in a green economy. That came from a, a real hard, uh, economic shock, which was a dramatic decline in trade. And at that point, we thought, okay, well, the foreign debt is incredibly uh, high. It's 185 billion US. Um, and then interest rates soared. So the, the risk um, of uh, international investors suddenly, um, you know, was, was very much oriented to buying US dollars and, you know, supporting the sort of core finance and the potential for for borrowing here was less. And so the interest rate was greater. And in all those ways, the international economy was uh, you know, going through a great depression. Uh, South Africa looked to be even 10% decline. It didn't work out quite like that. And the reason was there was a, it was a great deal of um, quantitative easing and um, fiscal stimulus all over. We only had a small amount. And since the IEJ is in the house, I'll certainly defer to, to their more detailed studies. But roughly of the 500 billion 
only about 20%. I think Duma also has done some, some updated studies on exactly how much fiscal stimulus. Um, but instead of that uh, contributing to kind of uplifting the world, say 2009, 10, 11, when the IMF was reflated with the recapitalization and all the, the world was, was doing monetary uh, loosening, quantitative easing, and sort of lifting up in an artificial Keynesian credit uh, and financial bubbling way. Um, we didn't have much of that. Um, so what we want to look at is how, um, just very quickly, our ability to say this is a crisis um, has been limited by the bounce back, a surprising bounce back that instead of a 7%, uh, sorry, a 10% decline in GDP, it was only 7%. But particularly for, I think, one reason above all, um, the sudden and unexpected, I certainly didn't expect it, uh, resurgence of commodity prices has lifted the rand. And so there's a sort of celebration going on amongst the mineral energy complex, the people we need to, to contest most vigorously because of what you're seeing on the right-hand side, that is the general commodity price increases. And our currency very closely correlates to uh, commodity prices. So, so it's a very important problem for us that commodity prices are, are up again. I have a gut feel that they, they won't stay up. We, we last saw, as you can see from the graph, um, commodity prices crashed in 2008, soared again in 2009, 10 and 11. Those were the three years that the Chinese economy was booming with inward oriented infrastructure led you know, heavy industrial um, economic activity that picked up from the rest of the world uh, you know, in, in a crisis and kept those commodity prices high. They stayed high really through 2015 and then uh, crash. You can see the 2015 to 16 crash is substantial. Um, in, uh, if we look particularly at raw materials from Africa, and for us it was particularly uh, difficult because um, platinum crashed because Volkswagen and some of the other car companies were cheating on their uh, emissions uh, testing, right, where they were trying to show that by having platinum in their catalytic catalytic converters, their cars, especially diesel engines, were much more efficient than in reality they were. They actually put in software to, to jig these um, um, testing systems. And so commodity prices crashed. Now, the dilemma is that at the same time, especially since 2015's lows, we've seen this resurgence. There was a big crash uh, in the JSC, but a resurgence in stock markets everywhere. And South Africa's lead actually going up as high as 69,000, now in the 67,000 range. That's the all share index. But if you calculate the value of South Africa's uh, market shares of all of the JC companies, divide by GDP, it's what's called the Buffett indicator. And that Buffett indicator is what Warren Buffett came up with to sort of represent um, market capitalization over GDP, what his, his favorite way of assessing whether stocks were overvalued or undervalued. So my friends, we have the most overvalued national level stock market in world history. It's 400% at that level uh, that you're seeing uh, in the last few days, a few weeks really. Um, so we've got some really serious problems just that we should confront openly, which is that the financial bubbling has been so desperately destructive, right? At very high interest rates, the borrowing rates that, that we're seeing, I go through this in detail in the paper, um, are um, fourth highest in the world today, only Turkey, uh, Brazil, and Pakistan, among the 50 or so countries that issue 10-year bonds, pay a higher interest rate than South Africans uh, bar uh, lending in, uh, or borrowing in international markets, issuing these securities. So we have very, very high-priced foreign debt. When I said it was 185 billion, that's how it started in 2020. But suddenly, $30 billion worth of South African securities were purchased locally because they were being dumped internationally. So we're down to about 155 billion. Still, that's a lot. That's about 51% of our GDP. Um, to me, that's a much greater fear. And I know Duma Kabuli's you know, nodding. It's a much greater fear than domestic because um, foreign debt um, is something that as the currency falls, now it's been rising, it was 19 in uh, January of, oh, sorry, it was 14 in January of 2020. It went down to 19 in April of 2020. And then it's come up 13.6 or so, I think today 14.3. So it's come up, the currency strengthened for sure. And with World Bank loans, BRICS New Development Bank loans, 
um, a few other uh, lenders. We actually haven't had um, the um, extraordinary foreign debt uh, crisis that it was logical to predict that currency strength and the inflows of revenues from selling minerals have been high enough. But it makes me wonder whether we are going to win a, a macroeconomic uh, argument under these kinds of conditions, because um, the arrogance of the minerals energy complex and the financial sector with these kinds of, um, I'm kind of giving you their good news, right? How they would brag after a couple of beers at the end of the day, they're, hey, you know, the economy's doing great. Well, we've got to make the argument that it's not. So what I'd like to quickly do is move to um, the, I think the micro level, which if you saw car power ships go down, sink, we hope, I mean, they may refloat it, but it's sunk on the basis of environmental impact assessment problems. A company called Triplo4 was there doing that EIAs and they were, they were slobs and, uh, you know, warmest uh, congratulations to groups like uh, the Green Connection and the Z-Wave McDade or Groundwork and Bobby Peak and, and Earthlife and Center for Environmental Rights. They, they've been tripping up car power ships. So it's one of my top 25, but um, in any event, it's probably a, uh, you know, Gwady Mintosh is gonna, is gonna come back on it. So let me give you my 25 um, favorite projects that at micro level, um, with extremely important macro implications, we have to stop. So I think I'll just run through them really fast. They're in the paper and I describe what I think would be the lines of argument against them. And I wanna come back to that to conclude because, uh, because Vishwas has opened up this conceptual um, potential, which I, I didn't really put into the paper, but something I'd love to talk about, which is what can environmental economics do to help us both fight on the macro front and then specifically on, on micro. Uh, and the micro would include these, these uh, 25 projects, which I want to argue when I show you what Herman Daly and um, Samir Amin and others have, have argued about nature, about the values of nature, which, which I think Vishwas is right to, to sort of scathingly call natural capital. But we have to come back and look at that phraseology. When we look at that, when we look at the incredible damage being done to nature by these projects, they should never, none of them, be um, up for, up for um, financing. So we have coal-fired power plants based on coal mining, Kusile, um, still under construction, Madupi nearly done. Um, and uh, these are the two largest under construction in the world. And they're in terrible shape, right? The, the, even like the, um, the conveyor belts that bring the coal into the power plants are, are screwed. And the, um, the boilers aren't working and, and you know, they had to do 7,000 rewelding. And I think part of that is gonna be our critique of Hitachi, which is the main firm doing all of this work because it's in alliance with Chancellor House. And I have to have a footnote, you, you uh, forgive me, but there's a personal problem here, which is that the man who was the ESCOM chair who authorized Kusile and Medupe um, was also on the ANC Finance Committee. Um, and he was called out by the then public protector for an obvious conflict of interest because Hitachi had bribed, I'll say this on the record, had bribed the ANC because Hitachi actually was being prosecuted by the United States government. And in 2015, under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, actually made a settlement and paid a $19 million fine. We didn't get the fine that you, the consumer, you, the taxpayer, uh, it went to the US government. But the point is that effectively Hitachi has conceded it bribed the ANC with a 25% share. And the man who did that, who was called out on it by the public protector, but it went through anyway and got huge loans that we have to pay back. This is a big part of the macro story, isn't it? The, the ESCOM debt, 400 billion rand. That man is head basically of the presidential um, climate change uh, commission, the, uh, whatever it's called, P4C. And that man, Vali Musa, is somebody we need to keep reminding the society he just simply cannot be trusted. I mean, what they did yesterday or two, a couple of days ago was lower the um, top line of what they thought from 440 to 420 um, megatons of carbon a year could be floated into the uh, UNFCCC, right, as the nationally determined contribution. In other words, they did a very trivial, a tokenistic decline from 440 million tons a year to 420. Absolutely, you know, trivial. Uh, so we've just, I think, got to call them out. Luckily, we've got good people on that commission like Bobby Peake, Makoma Lakala Kala, um, Melissa from, uh, uh, Earth, from CER. We've got great people to make the argument, but I think it's up to us in the society to simply say this is 
absolutely not good enough what Chippy Oliver, the, the sort of manager of the process and the chair, um, Vali Musa have done. And that's that's why. Now, the Messina Mercado is going to be nearly as big, 4,600 megawatts is what they tried. Again, that's going to be a major macro implications because um, it would be Chinese foreign investment. So they'd have to be continually repaid. Now, because of a lot of pressure, including from some of these groups like um, Earthlife, CER, um, a, a, a very interesting and probably untenable alliance of white conservationist um, farmers, a Saudi prince, um, uh, big agro capital, plus the community movements and EJ people. That looks like it's being um, also um, you know, cut down massively. So instead of 4,600 megs, it's going to be 1,320 if it goes through. But there's, again, a lot of good contestation going on out there. Similarly, more um, Mpumalanga coal-fired power plants will be kept going uh, beyond their lifespan. And then uh, the second group, are. Brolpada um, and the other finds in the vicinity, um, the Drakensberg and Karoo uh, fracking that we think we'll get going fairly soon, Shell in the Karoo, the CSIR, well, there's climate scientists, I don't think they have any, but if they do, I mean, their climate scientists are the 3% the of the world scientists who are denialists because they're promoting a national gas pipeline, right, uh, for uh, all these big finds that are going to be offshore. Sasol um, in Secunda is still the number one point of a source of CO2 emission in the world. And in South Durban, um, a massive contestation of the refineries engine blew up last December. And so it's actually offline, yeah. but they're trying to bring it back as a, a major um, oil uh, storage site. Sapref, BP Shell, the biggest of these refineries in, in South Africa, keep going and, and Setsi fights them very hard and also fights offshore KZN exploratory gas and oil drilling and is making progress there, as you see in Daily Maverick today. Um, then there was also supposed to be this car power ships with, I think it was actually 1800 and, uh, megawatts in uh, generation. And hopefully those are sunk by the environmentalists. But let me tell you the really bad news that some of the worst stuff is really still underway. The 18 billion tons of Limpopo coal and again, a macro implication, this is meant to earn lots of hard currency, but you sell it to India, you sell it now increasingly to China again because of the, the conflicts they have with Australia. So through Richards Bay, an 800 billion rand project. Now it's Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission Strategic Integrated Project number one. And then if they get the 18 billion tons out of the Waterberg, dig it up a terrible mess, you know, they're kind of running out in Mpumalanga, then we can also anticipate 200 billion tons from Botswana. And then there's the second, which is now still underway, was there the other day, the, the Port Petrochemical Complex expansion. That's PICSIP number two, um, and a huge increase in cargo. The original national development plan, you know, co-chaired uh, co by Cyril Ramaphosa, um, called for an expansion of the uh, containers that go through that port from current levels of 2.67 million a year, up to 20 million a year, nearly eight times as much. And they want to take the old Durban airport and dig it out and make a dig out port. And there's also a huge new pipeline which triples the capacity. That's PICSIP2, 250 billion. So these are the sort of mega projects. I, I hope we keep our eyes on the, the price there. Um, and then there's just all this kind of opposition and friction around um, renewables, potentials for social ownership and, uh, the sort of community, labor, all those sort of strategies we've all been saying on the green left uh, seem to be very, very low for actual uh, implementation. And then there's shipping related emissions from um, South Africa's very, I think, fragile relationship to, to world trade. Fragile because not just ships, but truck-based transport make the um, carbon content of all of our exports much higher. Than average. I mean, we're uh, basically rated number three in the world for the emissions per unit of output per person. Um, only Kazakhstan and the Czech Republic have higher ratios using that, um, that variable. And that means when there's carbon taxes or, or border adjustment taxes, as they'll be called, um, and they are going to be coming in and we're already being you know, threatened with very, very high tariffs that would make South African exports much less um, much less competitive. It's very important for us to get into the question of trade and whether the shipping related emissions and trucking uh, based transport, since there's very little tr um, transnet carrying of these containers, it's all on trucks. Um, and then also air travel, right? We've had, especially with our long distance um, uh, 
uh, air um, travel to the main uh, sources of, of wealthy tourists, a uh, very, very high carbon content for tourism. So that too will come under very severe contestation. We have um, terrible suburban sprawl. Right now, the major project where I am here in Durban is a massive expansion of the uh, highway widening uh, project. And then we have uh, the, the auto industry. There's a huge uh, subsidy every year to make our cars that are coming out of Toyota just uh, down the road for me, um, or Eastern Cape or, or uh, Roslyn, those, those auto plants to make them internationally competitive. 30 billion a year in state subsidies going to encourage exports of these mainly German and Japanese luxury autos. None of them electric cars, right? We have fertilizer production um, for export oriented agriculture, increasing amounts, and that's very carbon intensive. Petrochemical industry um, for exports and local consumption, very carbon intensive deep mining and smelting requiring vast sums of electricity and potentially rising because if this commodity price cycle stays up, platinum group uh, metals um, and gold um, and iron ore for steel um, and coal, which goes into all of the smelting will all, will all increase. So these are some of the bad news. The last set of bad news is what we do in the region. And what we learned yesterday was shocking, wasn't it? That in Mozambique's gas fields, especially in the north, um, in um, Cabo Delgado, I think that's one of these here. There's probably going to be 1,500 troops, South African National Defense Force troops, going in to defend Total, the French oil company, to dig uh, for uh, oil there. And, and um, several South African companies are also very involved. Standard Bank is still very involved in the big oil pipeline from Uganda to Tanzania, right? And so in all of these respects, we, we would have what I, I mean, there's talk of a Inga, the hydropower project and the Congo River, that's not a solution to climate crisis because in the tropics, when uh, in these mega dams, there's rot of the vegetation underneath, then much more uh, methane escapes, right? Now, mostly since Vishwas has already said, this is all about trying to, to marry red and green perspectives, to bring, to bring Marxism into a dialogue. Um, and I know we have some wonderful Keynesians in the house who may not be that interested in, um, in Samir Amin. Um, and by the way, if, if Jane, if you could give me a five minute warning or two minute warning, whatever you'd like. Um, I do want to very quickly end with um, the contestation between Marxists uh, like Samir Amin, who said basically, we screwed up, uh, comrades. We passed an eraser, right, over uh, over the environment, over the analyses that even Marx had picked up, and, and certainly Rosa Luxemburg. Um, and uh, it, we took the point of the bourgeoisie. We equated a rational point of view to the exploitation of natural resources. And here, Vishwas is where I would like to come back with the question of of natural capital and how we can jujitsu that, right? Because I'm. I'm entirely with you that we want to avoid, uh, you know, being drawn into things like the carbon markets or biodiversity offset, the kinds of things when you commodify the environment. But I do think we have something to learn from a few reformers, and two of them, you probably have heard of Gro Harlem Brundtland and the Brundtland Commission, and one of her assistants was a neoliberal, uh, Bernard Chidzero, finance minister of Zimbabwe. I've had lots of, you know, long critiques of, but what they came up with, I, you know, full support development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Now they do that by saying, we've got to meet the needs of the world's poor and we've got to be aware of environmental limits. But that first definition of sustainability, I think we should be using a, a great deal more. And here's why, because they start counting and they don't use a natural capital framework. I'm gonna to turn to Herman Daly, as you mentioned, Vish, in just one moment. Um, but what they say is terribly important, I think for us to think about future generations because we, draw too heavily, too quickly on already overdrawn environmental resource accounts. So that's, a, that's an intellectual problem. How do you account for nature? It's priceless. How do you, how do, you do that? I mean, insurance companies account for people's deaths or you know, I'm a guitarist, let's say I lose my finger. No, they can, insurance company will probably put some price on it and pay me off. Um, but basically we have a critique of the way we fail to internalize externalities. Right, And this is to me a critical way for us to think forward about um, environmental capital that we borrow from future generations with no intention or prospect of repaying. It's part of what I think we have to do with our macro. And I've had some very interesting discussions with people. In the paper, you'll see a long discussion of why we need to change GDP. And this is one of the reasons because our natural uh, non-renewable, our depleted 
wealth is not ever included. One way they include is income. I'll show you in more detail in just a second. We can never collect, sorry, they, the, the kids, my, my daughter, uh, her kids, you know, the next generations can never collect on our debt to them. We act as we do because we can get away with it. Future generations don't vote. They have no political or financial power. They cannot challenge our decisions, right? So today's decision makers will be dead. There's acid rain, the global warming, uh, ozone depletion, which actually was solved by a 1987 Montreal Protocol, the widespread desertification, species loss, you know, screwing up the ocean and all the rest. This is something that I owe to future generations, a climate debt, an ecological debt, and that the North owes to the South. And the young who have most to lose, who are the harshest critics of uh, business as usual, have resurfaced their generational rage through Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Future and all of the other youth that are so impressive in this country and around the world are beginning to pick up. And probably the strongest critic of the um, failure to account for future generations' interests is Lumumba Diaping, a name you may remember from Copenhagen. He was the negotiator who really called the North out on their extraordinary, um, he called it a kind of new Holocaust, the, uh, his critique of uh, the Copenhagen Accord and especially of the South Africans who were there. I mean, he was very open about saying the South African negotiating team, I mean, you can, you know, name all of them. They're all actually, one of them is head of national business initiative, John Yawich, and she made a special complaint against him. Um, but he was very clear in Copenhagen, and he's been very clear in a committee, it's called the uh, Rights of Future Generations Working Group, I've had a little bit to do with it, and um, we're obligated morally and equally on behalf of prosperity. So how do we do it? What I'll very quickly now conclude with is how, as Vishwas began this discussion, bourgeois economists have had to confront their own uh, discipline's failure to pick up these environmental problems, especially exhaustible resources. So the most famous statement comes from John Hartwick, who worked very closely with Robert Solow at uh, Massachusetts Institute for Technology. So if you're getting resources, you should invest all profits or rents from these depletable resources in reproducible capital, such as machines. And later they would say, yeah, but also education because you want human capital. Okay, I know we hate that framing, but let's just work with this. The current generation is shortchanging future generations by overconsuming. This is very applicable, right, to our climate debt analysis and to the economics of how we cost in, sometimes called the social cost of greenhouse gases. This is now making a big comeback because Biden's people have reintroduced this concept. Friends of the Earth came out this last week with a very, very good critique. So I'd like to jump from work I've been doing now into the social cost of greenhouse gases because um, the current generation lives off the current flows, right? And, and Robert Solo um, from MIT, and they work together on how we owe to the future a volume of investment that will compensate for taking away the natural capital. Okay, sorry again, using that phrase, right? Um, because what we're doing is, is uh, without all the details, basically providing less amply for citizens by failing to incorporate the future generations and it's not in the natural capital accounts. So um, very quickly, Daly and Costanza are the two who took um, this weak version where you can substitute, you take out your minerals, but then you build machines or invest in you know, free Norwegian education, which they can do because of their oil fund. So Costanza and Herman Daly said, it's not actually um, quite so analogous because you can't equate a bit of capital taken out to um, inventories and, and because they're subject to liquidation. So what, what Daly did in his book, Beyond Growth, and especially when he resigned from the World Bank was insist we stop counting natural capital as income and we tax the resource through throughput more and we maximize uh, productivity of natural capital, invest in increasing its supply and then stop this export oriented growth. We need domestic production for internal markets. Without going through all the details, this is really profound for changing GDP because even the World Bank has a natural capital accounts that Vishwas, I think you and everyone should be delving into. We know we're incredibly wealthy because Citibank said at one point with two and a half trillion dollars, right? The largest mineral resource base in the world. This is extraordinary, right? We have 88% of uh, platinum group metals, 80% of manganese, 72% of chrome, vanadium, gold. Um, but South Africa is failing to capitalize. And I think as we rethink GDP, here's the IMF with the uh, October 2018 
managing um, the fiscal assets of, of the state. And you'll see South Africa, at one of the highest levels of wealth, right? The resource wealth of states, uh, we're behind Russia, Kazakhstan, you know, oil, oil rich, gas rich countries, and a few others that weren't included in this, but way ahead of Great Britain. I think have to wrap up. I'm going to wrap up right now. Good. The reason is that what I'd like us to be able to do is to challenge bourgeois economists for not doing a very good job. And so what the stats show and what the paper shows, if you do these natural capital accounts, let's just come right down to the punchline, which is here. Once you start doing them and you change GDP, you don't have growth. Once you start depleting the wealth and calling it that, right? You get income from selling the minerals, but you know you also get damage and the damage is depleted wealth and the second damage is CO2 damage. Even the World Bank there puts us at a 6.8% annual decline. So anybody using GDP as if it's unproblematic, really re rethink please because this um, extraordinary natural capital accounting revelation, right? That once you actually try to understand the wealth depletion and the pollution damage, it really is, is wicked. So without going into any further details on this, uh, genuine savings, lots of ways to calculate, Angola being really the worst at losing its wealth. And then the, ultimately the, 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 the bottom line on this is when you do lose wealth, you get social resistance. And even in the American Economic Review, they've done correlations of mining and extractive industries and high carbon activities with social protests. So I'll leave that there because I think when I showed you those 25 sites where we are seeing exceptionally um, carbon intensive investments, building back worse in spite of that lovely rhetoric from a year ago, which I you know, fill up the paper with all that great build back better stuff of, of Ramaphosa and Trudy Mackay, all that wonderful rhetoric. The harsh reality is all of the worst processes are being amplified, partly because it's commodity uh, upsurge. It's just irrational. It's got to it's got to break, and secondly, because of this even more irrational financial bubbling in the JSC, you know, going up forty five percent since last April, even though we've had the seven percent crash in the real economy, insane. So these are the sorts of things I hope we'll be able to dig into because they're methodological. But ultimately, dear comrades, it's going to rely upon a real uh, um, upsurge of protests at these um, appalling sites of carbon intensity for us to make any dent and demand a new macro that isn't so reliant on natural capital depletion and carbon intensity. Thanks. Thank you so much, Patrick. That was great. Um, and as we said to everyone, um, you know, the papers are going to be enriched by comments, critique, input today. And then we will share that, but we'll also share the recording of Patrick's presentation. So uh, you've eaten a bit into our discussion. I'm, I'm just going to lead for a few minutes from the COPAC side, and that's how we set it up. To just give some comments. We workshop the papers ourselves, by the way, um, and, uh, and we've read them very closely. Response to Patrick, and then we'll open it up. And the idea is the takeaways become part of the revisions and, and where we want to go. So, so Patrick, I mean, this, this, in your paper, you make a very, very important point about climate debt. And, you know, South Africa being a carbon criminal state, uh, it owes a climate debt and so on. And we've seen that in all the, the projects you've identified and so on. But we need, we need numbers now. We need to find a way in which we can quantify this climate debt. And we'd like that to come through in the next iteration of this paper. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe um, there, there is some kind of methodological tool that can take us there, uh, but we'd like you to, to find it and help us quantify this. The other issue related to this is shocks are going to come with more of these fossil fuel investments. Now you mentioned social costs uh, somewhere down the road in your presentation. Now we've had one of the worst droughts in the history of this country, but we haven't really had economists tell us in clear terms how much this drought has cost us, okay? So we really would like it if you could really start giving us some sense, even using the drought as a model to cost out what further heating and longer duration and deeper droughts will mean with these fossil fuel investments. We need a sense of those social uh, costs uh, coming out. 
The other is the issue of pollution debt. Um, now, yeah, I want to make the distinction between sort of climate debt and, of course, shocks. But pollution debt coming out of these fossil fuel investments is another issue. And again, if that can be conceptualized and then given some magnitudes, some quantification, that will also help the arguments uh, that we need to be surfacing in the national debate in the country. We know about work around ESCOM, and we know about the number of deaths anywhere between two to 3,000 per year, et cetera, people dying, et cetera. We know about the health consequences of ESCOM, uh, et cetera. But there are going to be pollution costs coming out of these investments, and we need that. Now, just to come to natural capital, and I can understand how you're using it, and, and you're using it to, to kind of give us this bigger picture of, if you like, the resources of the South African economy. And there's, there's a valuable um, sort of tactical advantage by going down this route. And I think you're right. You know, we, we don't want to use a natural capital accounting method to end up with market-based policies and, 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 and neoliberal policies. Um, but at the same time, there are other problems with natural capital accounting. I mean, one of the problems is using price in the market uh, to aggregate uh, natural relations, uh, which cannot be reduced to a simple unit of money. It's, it's, it's much more complicated than that. I mean, the other issue, of course, is the cycles of nature itself. And uh, when we go down this road of natural uh, accounting, um, you know, there's the assumption that you can invest in nature and you can recuperate nature and you can get nature back, et cetera. Et cetera. And that's a falsehood, actually. Um, so again, they, 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 there's a deeper sort of anthropocentric depending here, which we've got to be cautious about. Um, I think the other point is that even the market mechanism and pricing, even if there's a shortage of supply, it doesn't mean that it will will stop the denuding of a resource, okay? Uh, so there's a whole set of problems with natural capital, the price mechanism, and, and, and using the, the, the market. Um, what I prefer to call the commons. So I, I think what, what the point I'm getting at is, this is also another way of thinking about our society, our country, and to bring that into the conversation as well. And we know there's been great academic work done on this by Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize for it. And, you know, recognizing that commons and commons management is variegated in the world. There are different rules and different norms and systems. But we have a residual practice of common manage, commons management in South Africa. We're seeing it in the Amadiba struggle. Uh, we're seeing it in various frontline struggles against the encroachment of other forms of mining, against traditional leaders. Uh, exact, et cetera, et cetera. So the commons is for me a very, very important idea that we also got to keep in this perspective. Uh, I mean, if we were to, to address and for natural solutions in the charter, we have 10 bioregions in South Africa and the bioregions are very, very important as part of natural climate solutions, defending the commons. And so we, we really got to think about that idea alongside the tactical value of, of what you're saying around natural capital. The point of ours, by the way, <laughs> Ibrahim Patel has been reacting. He's been reacting to car manufacturers and analysts rather, rather in South Africa. And, uh, and, and most of them recognize that the context is changing very, very fast. I mean, with the combustion engine being banned in, say, the UK, with the European Union now also setting targets on transition way more ambitious than the US, uh, car manufacturers in South Africa have put the squeeze on Ibrahim Patel. And hence, suddenly, out of the blue, we have an electrical vehicle's green paper. Okay? And there are very, very serious problems with that green paper. That green paper doesn't talk about public transport as part of electrical vehicle manufacturing, for example. And, um, and so anyway, government's master plan for auto and manufacturing in South Africa has had nothing to do with electrical vehicles. OK, what we are seeing is an add on. But again, I think we've got to do some work around clean energy, public transport, which brings me to to the, you know, the various alternatives that you've surfaced in your paper. 
One of them, by the way, being the nationalization of our banks. Now, I think that's a very, very important proposition, but, and we prefer to call them democratic public utilities. That's the language we use in the chart. And we'd also like to talk about the diversification of the financial system, the cooperative banks as well. So we manage the surplus of society, but give us more, more detailed insight, Patrick, around these proposals. So how big is our financial system in value terms? The big banks, how much of capital do they have? Okay, uh, How much of capital do they have invested in, in carbon-based investments and so on? Because I think it's important that we have more of a case uh, if we're going to go in this direction beyond just because you derived it from your analysis of the current crisis dynamics of the South African COVID economy. But, but help us get more detail around this. Similarly, the taxes that you advocate, the Tobin tax. I mean, how much will that yield? What is the volume of hot money and transactions that are happening in the South African economy? And if we slap on a Tobin tax tomorrow, what, what will be the yield from that? It'll be really nice to get more detail on that. I mean, similarly with the land taxes or the carbon tax. I mean, you've made a very profound point. Our carbon tax is dismal. Okay, compared to say Sweden, for for instance, but if we were to graduate this upwards and progressively target it, what would be the quantum from this? The argument, and then lastly, just the issue of planning. I mean, planning is very very important for the macroeconomy, for the climate crisis, and I'd love to hear your views on this because you you know you haven't really gotten into it, um, and I think it's a theme that will come up even with the other papers. So I'll just stop there. And I don't know if you want to respond um, or whether you want us to take more comments and questions because we are going to do that as well. Well, it's, it's so overwhelming and such great material that you've thrown out. Would uh, comrades allow me to very quickly reply to a couple of the points? Um, I also see Michelle is engaging on the chat and I'm sorry, I wasn't watching chat until now. Uh, I will come back to Dr. to Bongani in a moment, but um, if I just click now, you'll see that the first point, Vishwas, where you're worried, Michelle is worried, that even though we want to um, claim there's a climate debt, we don't want to turn it into um, the valuation of nature through a price mechanism. However, I think we can do that. I think there's ways to avoid saying that um, by valuing, by pricing uh, nature, it automatically goes to emissions tradings offsets, biodiversity offsets, all of the things we'd be worried about. And the reason is I think there are two things uh, that can be done. And one of them, I was very encouraged in the car powership critique that the um, capacities of our environmental impact assessment consultants, oh, I mean, consultants, I always make that mistake. Anyway, those consultants, especially the one that was nailed yesterday, Triplo 4, they have no clue as to how to do things like deep marine, you know, implications of um, these car power ships, right? They just kind of just said, oh, it's fine, no, no worries. What I found, especially in contesting in both uh, Durban against the port expansion, as well as uh, Messina Makata, is that the same kinds of consultants have no, no clue about um, the ecosystem valuation. So they can't even do the pricing, which means uh, in addition to climate debt, our rationale for using full cost accounting, technical accounting to say, you've forgotten to uh, measure the depleted wealth that goes into uh, making Messina Mercado uh, special economic zone smelters successful. You've forgotten to calculate the wealth of future generations that are shrinking because of this that really leaves them stumped. And it's a sabotage technique um, for the EIA process that I think we all have to be concerned about. One or two of you, somebody was asking about the legal implications. It really is, I think, an enormous um, terrain um, for us to um, halt these fossil intensive projects with all the macro implications as well. Um, if we use natural capital accounts to show that we're losing too much of nature's value, including Vishwas, the damage from pollution. Of course, that's always sort of roughly calculated and estimated. But now I'm saying natural capital accounts let us go even deeper and I think make a much stronger case against um, any resource extractive, any extractivist sort of project. On the climate debt, um, it is interesting, isn't it, that it's come into popular discourse. There's about a half dozen groups that have said, instead of sending our set of troops to make a mess, we know how much of a mess they made given what they did when uh, 80,000 were here in 
uh, enforcing lockdown or in Mitchell's plane, but also in Lesotho in 98 and Central African Republic in 2013 and the DRC ever since. Our sand of troops, I mean, some joke and call them abenas because they're kind of idiots and uh, out of shape, but really they do terrible damage. And they're going to be joined by two even worse armies, the Zimbabwe Defense Force, uh, Zimbabwe National Army, and the Angolans. And so when they go into Cabo Delgado, what our allies have been saying, who are they? Um, SAPSEN, Southern African People's Solidarity Network, uh, WOMEN, uh, SAFTU, um, uh, JA, Justice Ambiental, other Mozambicans. What they've been saying is, you in South Africa owe us not bombs and bullets, you owe us a climate debt. So I think you're right, uh, Vishwas, let me make that next stab at that kind of calculation, because even the government has said the North owes um, South Africa climate debt, and that will pay for us not extracting coal from Mpumalanga. They, as you can see in my chat, they actually stuck that right into the nationally determined contributions, right? And I'm with you, Michelle, not applying economic metrics to everything, but at the level where we're trying to, you know, kind of get into the debates into environmental impact assessments into justifying reparations. I think Michelle has been watching and many of you have the, the debate over reparations in, in the US from Black Lives Matter. And they're putting numbers to the to the damages done to the African-American population. Some of them are, you know, very large numbers, $777 billion is one that uh, is used. But, you know, there's also a way to say uh, these are rough estimates. Um, Yes, you're right. It is a philosophical issue that we consider um, that uh, nature or human life is priceless and shouldn't be shouldn't be uh, quantified. But I mean, you have to admit, Michelle, when you do have a an insurance policy, there is some you know payment to your loved ones if there's uh, anything that happens to you. So this is happening in any case. We're all part of it. And I think the main thing is to avoid um, it working against us by turning it into markets. And that is a big danger. And we know, I mean, I can tell you in awful detail, the pilots for carbon markets, especially the one where my rubbish goes here in Durban, which is called Basasa Road. It was the first pilot, right? And uh, a wonderful woman, a Sajida Khan, who was our sort of version of Erin Brockovich died as a result of her fighting that uh, project. And, and so we know the massive dangers of carbon markets, especially that they're very speculative. They go way up during these periods when you've got a lot of money, you know, flushing around in the system and then they crash and then they're useless. So um, the carbon market strategy, which is John Kerry, uh, the climate the US, which is the EU trying to revitalize, they pushed the carbon price up to 50 a ton, which brings me to where Vish Vishwas asks, could we not um, start doing some of these accounts about our own carbon taxation and its limitations? You know, it's very interesting, Vishwas, the difficulty, it's, it's what's called um, the um, elasticity, right? Which means if you put a price on something, it's going to change uh, how people consume and it's going to change how, how a uh, company uh, reacts. Now, I think we'd all love to see a price, let's say, you know, a carbon price of $100 a ton. Sweden's is 132. That would sink Sassel. Secunda would be clean air. It would be wonderful. But we actually have to go into those debates in a way, Vishwas, with a model of some sort that says, actually, uh, there'll be enough in this tax to finance a just transition. So I think that's a very good challenge. I haven't seen anyone do it. When I talked to Treasury and the group, they had they hired a little consultancy called TIPS, a Trade and Industrial Policy Strategy to do carbon taxing. You know what they're at, it's a 42 cents a ton. I just said, stop wasting our time, just go and do whatever you want, but we'll just condemn you because it's like so many things in this country that you're saying you're doing, it's simply tokenistic. And the final re um, reaction to, to Vishwas's challenge is to think about whether an alternative framing to pricing everything and commodifying everything is commoning everything, commoning as much as we can. And indeed, uh, Vishwas has said, okay, Amadiba Crisis Committee has got that sense of the land and the common owned land and the uh, resistance to the mining house coming in. All of that is absolutely excellent. What I would say though, is we've won commons in much bigger ways. And I would think of the single biggest need for a commons right now, I think you'd all agree with me, you know, especially if you're in Kauteng right now, is a COVID-19 vaccine and treatment that is generic, that isn't condemned by intellectual property to be a profit center for big pharma corps. We'd all agree, no, no question. To common intellectual property on medicines is something South Africa did, not the government, but the people, right? It was the drive of the treatment action campaign to get AIDS medicines. The result of getting those medicines 
uh, for free now, or made generically at very low cost by Aspen, and you know it's made all over Africa, and Ferrari, Uganda, there's factories. So to make those for free and then to supply them for free, sorry, to make them at a small cost, to supply them for free through the public health system has raised our life expectancy from 52 at the low in 2005 to 65 today, right? So the commoning vishwas on intellectual property is our greatest accomplishment. I don't know if any of the comrades in the house are from Soweto, but you've also been commenting your electricity, right? And now, of course, uh, um, Andre de Reiter is trying to decommon by doing what they call load reduction by hitting the areas that have particularly heavy uh, commoning populations where you're, you know, Soweto is 86%. Actually, yesterday, uh, just north of me in, in KZN and in Pangani, in one of the townships, it was 95% commenting of electricity. So they cut everybody off. And then there was a massive protest. It was a terrible mess there. I can send you the details. So this is a hot topic, right? This was the drive to decommodify, to make the commons for water and electricity, for um, antiretroviral medicines, of course, for higher education through fees must fall. And I'm completely with you that this is gonna be the direction. I think eco-socialists who are grounded, who are working with these mass movements and their uh, immediate struggles are gonna to have to do. I've never heard anyone in the in the townships of Ishwas say, we are commoning electricity. What they do say is, yeah, there's an electricity meter, but you know what it is now? It's, co it's called a statue, it's just standing there because we have the wires or the water pipes going underneath and it just sits there. So there's a certain pride in turning a commodity form a meter into a, a statue. But I think getting a philosophical ideological approach to commoning is, um, you know, I'm right with you on it. Other questions or comments or critiques from the crowd? Yeah, we have uh, another nine minutes. So for the session, anybody, uh, please put your hand up. Jane, are people empowered to do that or add your comment in the chat line or question? So you address Michelle. Anybody else wants to come in to engage uh, with Patrick? Please feel free. Anybody from the OPEC also who has comments, questions? Oh. Hello. Would, would I then be able there to very a, quickly? Is, is, is there sorry, there's a hand up here, Patrick. Good, good. Uh, who, it's it's me. It's Michelle. No, can I say something? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go Was ahead. Was it me? Or? Go ahead. Okay. So, yeah, go uh, ahead. Patrick, I mean, I, okay, thanks. I just want to push you a little further on this issue. I mean, you know, I don't think all commenting is equal. So your examples are easy ones because those were actually kind of um, services provided. And then we want to have some kind of way in which we, um, you know, we make those public goods, which I think, you know, yes, they should be part of the commons. But I think when we talk about, you know, non-human nature, when we talk about the fundamental basis on which our planet exists, that's a whole nother level in which we need to be able to philosophically and I think abstractly be able to argue that these, these are beyond economic metrics. These are, and, I, and so I, I hear the tactical reason and I understand that Black Lives Matter is doing this around kind of the costs to, to human lives, but I think there's something fundamentally different that we need to, we also need to think through that, uh, you know, that pollution, I mean, it, it shouldn't be um, devalued to the point that you can apply an economic metric. And I think we should be able to apply costs for destroying these things, but those would be costs not that we then apply to the actual thing itself, but rather we talk about what is, is needed for the destruction. Um, and that should be, you know, 10 times the cost of what it, would, what it would mean to clean up so that it's so unbelievably high, you know? And, but that means just apply it to, you can't just say, okay, this clean air is valued at this much, or, you know, this natural forest is valued at this much because this is what it would cost. Rather, you need to be able to say on a principle, we want to, we, you know, to, if you pollute or destroy things, you're going to be penalized this much. Then as you get away from this idea that we should um, accept economic metrics for all things, because we should not allow 
economic metrics to um, invade every part of, of our, our planets, our psyches, everything we do. Absolutely. Could I very quickly reply? Because I do think we have a, a good common ground we're kind of uh, slowly finding. I We can't Patrick, hear you, Patrick. Patrick, you're muted. Now I'm back. Um, what I've just been doing, Michelle, I, I'm, I'm finishing this weekend um, an article for the journal, you probably remember it, Science and Society, precisely about how we get a dialectic out of your challenge, which is to take your environmental justice principles and to take um, ecological modernization techniques like natural capital accounting and rub them together, bang them together, in search of a dialectic that takes us to eco-socialism, which is where maybe we can end because Vishwas said, where's your planning? You cannot do the kinds of things we need to um, ban uh, greenhouse gases ultimately, phase them out as soon as we can and ban them without planning. There's only, in my experience, there's only been one multilateral effort to do that. And that was with CFCs. I think everybody knows that, you know, in the old days when you're a little smelly and you put some underarm deodorant, deodorant, deodorant on your underarms. And what happened was CFCs came up. Do you remember the chlorofluorocarbon problem? So what's the problem? When they go up there, they, they open up the ozone hole and ultraviolet rays come in and fry us all. So they actually realized in, in the late 70s, this is a problem. And by 1987, the Montreal Protocol did what Michelle was hinting at. Michelle just said, let's make it prohibitively expensive for greenhouse gases to be emitted in the future. I'm with you. But you don't even have to use a price mechanism. You can ban them. How do we know that? Because they did that with CFCs and it actually solved the problem. It's actually the major multilateral solution to a global capitalist problem where they didn't try to internalize ex externalities, cap and trade, and they basically said, just stop. So I want to end by saying um, that there is a difference, a crucial distinction between what a bourgeois environmental economist would do, Michelle, which is what you worry about, which is to put a price on something and then let it, you know, let it go on the market. The most famous statement along those lines ever was Larry Summers. Probably people in the, in the, in the house have heard him. Uh, when in 1992, it was published, uh, December 91, he, he wrote a memo um, right before the Rio plus, or the Rio conference, the Earth Summit. And he said, the um, economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable. And we should face up to that. Do you remember that famous quote, right? He said, Africa is vastly under polluted using these accounts. Um, and so everybody, you know, made fun of him. And he was, it was actually a guy called Lant Pritchett, who our ideological opponents at the Center for Development and Enterprise brought in to uh, give a big talk a couple of days ago. Whew, Lant Pritchett actually wrote that and, and Summers plagiarized it. But that mentality is what we're against. It's to commodify everything and then do it so as to have a maximum maximization of, op, you know, of, of uh, utility and, and profits and all the rest. Now, what we would want to do instead, I, I offer you this crucial, crucial distinction. Instead of letting somebody be taxed, internalizing the externality and continuing, which is called a fee, right? You basically pay uh, a client, an ecological debt and then you pay a fee and you keep doing it. We would want, therefore, a different approach to that kind of mentality, which is what you could call instead fine and ban, right? Um, and a mechanism to ban or limit emissions does not exist, Brandon is saying. Correct. We don't have a Montreal Protocol that bans uh, greenhouse gases. But what we do have are all sorts of other strategies to um, absolutely kick out these companies. In the case of, you know, Bell Pottinger, we killed it, right? In the case of Cash Paymaster Services, we killed it. We have a great South African tradition of fighting hard to actually ban and, and to toss these bastards out of there. So I think demanding that the, that the fee um, and continuing pollution not be on the policy agenda, but that paying the climate debt, paying a fine, paying a fine for polluting in any case, and then going away, being banned, don't do it anymore. That would be the way I would get through your contradiction. I have tried to work it out as a sort of dialectical challenge. I think it's, I think it's going okay. I'm in a big dialogue with David Harvey about it because I criticize his approach to this. But um, as a very last point, I, I know Doctor was wanting 
the, the sort of sense of who is in the JSC bubbling up. I mean, it's one company above all called Tencent. It's where my pension is. Uh, I think Vishwas, Michelle, others who have pensions, we are deeply invested in the oppression of Chinese people through their equivalent of Facebook and Twitter and their social credit system that watches everything they do. It came in handy when it, you know, they needed to do track and trace on COVID a year or so ago, they, they stopped it in its tracks. But this is a very dangerous way for Vishwas, uh, Michelle and whoever else has a pension fund. We make money in the JSE because NASPERS bought a third of it. And NASPERS has just moved a big chunk of it to Amsterdam, it's called Process. But between the two of them, that's 27%, doctor. And also, doctor, you're asking the others. I mean, I'll send you my list if you like, if you email me of what's happening on the JSE and who's making money and which big family fortunes like the Ruperts, the Oppenheimers, you know, what's at stake there. But most of the smart money, not little people like me, because we have exchange controls, most of it's run away. And that answers Vishwas's final question, which I flagged here. How much money is there out there? Well, the JSC is about 18 trillion rand right now. And then the rest of the financial markets is about another 15, 17, something like that. Now there's been some devalorization, right? Because COVID wiped out big swaths, for example, of Santon property values, since it's kind of, if you go to Santon's, you know, fairly empty at the moment. So there's a really interesting restructuring that we don't really know which parts of the financial system are sound and which have toxic assets with them. So I think I'll take that challenge up, which is to do what we should all be doing all the time, which is if you're a Marxist, you know you have a, a theory of crisis, which says, the system is internally contradictory because it overproduces. The money that comes from the overproduction goes into financialization, and then it gets either valorized through high interest rates or stock market speculation, or devalorized, it crashes. And we get you know, major crashes, 2008, uh, 1998, massive crashes. And we haven't done that properly. And I admit, uh, uh, when I debate with my friends in the degrowth movement, I say that is actually the challenge is to say, what is weak? What is being devalorized? What should the, um, you know, should we buy up oil companies and coal companies and shut them down um, using quantitative easing? Really interesting questions. And I'm, I'm glad doctor, uh, as well as you Vishwas, you're putting these uh, to me for the next round as well. I'll try to do even more and hopefully you can get the paper circulated. And if other comrades want to say, uh, we don't like this. Or, I do think as a last point for I, my dear comrades in IEJ or Duma for Oscar, you comrades who are working with GDP, which we have to because that's what's out there, but you can really move our agenda forward if you change GDP to make it a more realistic assessment. And as you know, every feminist knows, women's unpaid labor is not counted, right? Social reproduction is not part of GDP. Uh, wear and tear and machines, the depreciation of fixed capital, that's not counted. Uh, pollution is not counted and depletion of resources. So really in a place like South Africa, when I showed you the, the natural capital accounts and the GDP figure should be 6.8% per year lower than it is if we do it properly by thinking about depleted wealth, pollution, okay. it's a good challenge. I'll say bye-bye then. Thanks comrades.